Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to this time and this place and this space of worship. This is our time to gather as a community, to gather together to support one another in our journeys, to celebrate uh, all that is wonderful, to mourn with each other and all the grief that we carry. This is our time. This is our place. This is our space of worship. We belong here together. And as you gather to share in this time of worship, let us pause to remember that we worship on lands that are by law, the unseen lands of Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. Our announcements are in the bulletin, and I have some extra ones up here as well. Let's go through our what's happening. So we have choir practice this morning at 10, and if you would like to join the choir, you're more than welcome. And everybody is welcome to join in in song, and uh, everybody can sing. So, uh, so join with us. Worship is now this afternoon at 2.30. We have our worship service at Glen Haven Manor. You are more than welcome to come join us for that service. Uh, I know the residents always appreciate it when we have a good representation from our church to worship with them. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful time of community and service to one another. And we go in through the downstairs door. Uh, so you come in around the back of the landing and we go on the downstairs door. If you want information, just ask me. At 6 o'clock tonight, we have our property committee meeting. Tuesday and Wednesday, our photos in the parlor. And Thursday afternoon from 3.35, our youth group is meeting. And our youth group is wonderful. What a wonderful group we had a meeting upstairs on Thursday afternoons with amazing leadership. If you are interested or you know someone who's interested in joining with the youth group, just let me know and uh, come join with us on 3.30. We come in this back door over here. Uh, in the evening at 6.30, we have our 100th anniversary committee meeting where we are preparing for the 100th anniversary of the United Church of Canada which will be in June of 2025, as well as the 75th anniversary of St. Paul United, which will be in June of 2025. So we are, we'll be preparing something special for that year at that time. This Saturday is our buy sale, 9 a.m. And I have, uh, so there's an announcement in the bulletin, but I have another announcement here I'd like to read for you. Thank you to everyone who has signed up for the April 13th buy sale. We have 50 volunteers. The dough makers will be coming for 8.30, and everyone else please come for 9 a.m. We're asking all workers to wear their hair pulled back and up. If you can, if your hair is short, please wear a cap. Um, if you haven't ordered your pies yet, you still have time. The list is in the narthex or the porch. Funny thing, fun fact, we looked up narthex this week. Guess what the first thing the dictionary said? It said it was a porch. <laughs> Sorry, I just felt really good when I looked that up. So, uh, so the porch is where the sign-up sheet is for, uh, and if you, you can also call Janice. Okay, continuing forward, oh, I wasn't there, there we go. Uh, looking ahead, church council meeting. Next week is our church council meeting. Uh, next Sunday, note the time, it's at 6 p.m., Typically, the church council meeting is in the afternoon this week because it is the final day of the music festival and there's a big concert at 2. We're having our meeting at 6. So if you're on church council, just note the time. Uh, then coming up, there's lots of other things. Christian education committee meeting, uh, sperm committee meeting, so forth and so on. Just a note that the, one of these meetings says it's on, I lost my note. What was that? It says it's on a Wednesday, but it's actually, no, it says it's on a Thursday. Oh, that's this one, the anniversary committee meeting. Thank you. That's actually on Wednesday. Right. Boop. Anniversary committee meeting is on Wednesday. So ignore everything I said earlier and go with that. Um, we, a warm welcome is extended to everyone, and we thank you to everyone who placed Easter memorials and memories of loved ones. $450 was raised and is much appreciated. Uh, I love the stewardship second for this week. When those who have more share with those who have less so that all have enough, we are walking in the footprints of the early believers. 
Thank you to everyone who helped out with this week uh, with our community luncheon. Uh, 77 meals were either eaten here at the church or delivered, and the meals were delicious, uh, and your work was very much appreciated. Thank you so much, everyone. Our next luncheon will be held on May the 1st. I'm trying to see what I have next on my slideshow. We went bowling yesterday. Woohoo! We have some pictures to share. What a fun time. Uh, it was a real fundraiser for the church. Uh, we had 47 people uh, bowling and more spectators. So we have some pictures of some of you like bowling. You see yourselves? Yeah, there you are. And uh, everybody had a good time. Everybody was really very well accomplished bowlers here. Um, and uh, the, the person who scored the lowest score got a trophy. <laughs> Arnold, that was you. <laughs> Sorry. Albert, that was you. You had the lowest score. You got a trophy. And there you were getting it from Eric. It was very cute. <laughs> and then the highest score went to Stephanie. Shocker. <laughs> Congratulations, Stephanie and Albert for your rolling and everyone else. It was a great time. Okay, Youth at Region. Um, this year, our Youth at Region is taking place from May 9th to 12th and 4th, and we already have three youth that are going. We have other youth that are interested, and it is welcome to any youth, grades 6 to 12, and if you know of any youth that are interested, Maybe show them this little video. This is a video that we made from last year after the youth got back. And I just thought I would show it again this year just to, to remind people, uh, if you're thinking about going to the region, how much fun it is.
when we were doing prayer groups, we made some bracelets, um, and we played like Taylor Swift songs and stuff, so that was like super awesome. Um, but we also had like large group, which was both of the groups um, come together and we sang songs, and we like hung out, and we had like a karaoke party on last night. Uh, what did you learn? I learned a lot of things. Mm. And praying, praying is not in one form. You can do this, like this. There's also many, many other ways, like art, parodies. Those are also acts of praying and like creativity. I've learned, like from the actual, like when we were in the meetings, um, a lot about discipleship and how to be unapologetically Christian. Oh, which was Michael Blair, I think that guy who was talking. A lot. <laughs> I learned uh, about like, we talked about crossroads a lot. Did you make any friends in the morning? I did. Um, so there's this girl named Hope. Uh, my friend Hope. Uh, did you make any friends? Yes. And Emily, uh, Sophie, and Patrick. Sophie. Who were they? Uh, I made friends. Uh, Sophie. There's two Sophies. Um, I also met Melody, Lily, Julianne. And then I got closer with Abby. Like we didn't talk much, and we really kind of bonded with people. Oh. And then Ava. Uh, and. I think his name was Patrick. <laughs> and I can't remember all their names, but that's alright. No, yeah, that's alright. Are you planning to go back next year? Yeah. Uh, do you think you'll go back next year? No. I'll send it to Tracy. Will you go back? Yes. And what would you tell someone who was thinking about going back, going next year? That is awesome, and they would have an amazing time. What would you tell someone who was thinking of going next year? Well, definitely be you from the start, because if you're not, then that's just that little awkward face. But if you're just you and open from the very no one's actually going to judge you or anything like that, or not. What would you tell somebody if they were thinking about going next year? Kiga, <laughs> they actually give you ice cream. On behalf of Victoria, Keely, and I, we want to thank the UCW and the Fed region for sponsoring and making it possible for us to go to this year's event. We had a great time. We also want to thank Pamela and Jack for driving us there and back, and everyone else who made it possible for us to attend. Thank you. because the cutoff date for registration is the 19th, and we would love to take it as many as we can again this year because it's such a great experience. Uh, a donation to the audiovisual equipment has been given in loving memory of Fred Dickey by parents Wayne and Nancy Dickey. And save the date for the auction and dessert even, evening. That is in the announcements. That's going to happen on May 29th. Mark on your calendars and read the announcement in the bulletin. Also, about the audiovisual equipment, the church has decided to purchase new camera with improved streamlined capabilities. And the camera's here, we just have to do some setup now. Uh, if you would like to contribute to this, uh, your donation will be greatly accept uh, accepted. Food bank information is there. Also, Look at all of the amazing, amazing resources we have compiled together to go to buy up to Karma Closet. Uh, these are all donated by you folks all throughout the Easter season. I will be taking them to Karma Closet this week, and where they will be very much appreciated and received for the students of Northumberland High School. Uh, it's a wonderful endeavor. Thank you so much to everybody for your generous donation. Also, the general UCW 
BMW will be meeting will be taking place following church on Sunday, April 28th. Please note that this is one week later than they you originally chose. So mark your calendar, UCW. Uh, it's April 28th. And I have a birthday here for April. Is there any other birthdays for them today? And is there anything else coming from the community? Well, we'll say happy birthday to April. She's not here today, so we'll just give a wave. Happy birthday, April. And uh, we will... Uh, if there's nothing else, continue with worship. With our call to worship. We are not alone. Live in the God of
now offer our prayer for wholeness and renewal. Let us pray. Loving God, as we gather in your presence today, we come with open hearts and open minds, seeking to encounter your grace and love afresh. We thank you um, that for sometimes as we fall short, as we choose selfishness rather than generosity, that you forgive us. Forgive us for the times when we turned away from you and from one another. And grant us the courage to seek forgiveness and reconciliation and to embrace the new life you offer to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear these words of assurance that we are forgiven. That though we may stumble and fall, God's grace is always available to us, forgiving and offering us new life. So let us rejoice, and we rejoice by saying, thanks be to God, amen and amen. Our opening hymn is, This is the Day That God Has Made. She picked the blueberries. She picked the blueberries. 
She made blueberry muffins. Sami yummy, big blueberry muffins. And she didn't know who had given her the blueberries, so she gave five blueberry muffins out to five different people. One of those people was the person who delivers her newspaper, her paper carrier. She sent the blueberry muffin out for them. And when they got there to deliver the newspaper, they saw that the note was for them, and they were so excited. They were like, this is blueberry muffin, is for me. And they ate the blueberry muffin, um, and they felt so good about it that they decided to be extra careful that day and not just throw the newspapers willy-nilly, sometimes in a bush or sometimes wherever they took the newspapers right back and put them on the people's steps. One of the people that got their newspaper delivered that way was Mr. Mai. And Mr. Mai was so excited that the newspaper delivery person was so kind to them that day that he was smiling all day. And everywhere he went, he had a big smile on. And then he was helping people. He helped five different people. And one of the people he helped was Mario. He helped Mario with his luggage.
Oh God, your word lights our path, and leads us forward, and inspires us in how we are called. Let us listen for your word for us this day. Amen. So we're reading from the book of Acts today. We don't normally read from the book of Acts. It's a, a problem with the lectionary. Remember the lectionary is the thing that tells us what to read every Sunday, and it goes in a three-year cycle? It, it suggests scripture for us each, each Sunday. Um, and in the lectionary, they only suggest the book of Acts, I think it's five times over three years. It's very little. But it is a book that I think is transformative. I think it's a book that's very important for us to listen to, to read as Christians, because it's the book that talks about how the early church, how the very first group of people who were following Jesus, who had been changed by the story of Jesus, who had been affected by Jesus, how they chose to live out their calling, and how they formed and structured themselves around this wonderful good news of God's love living among us. So, um, yeah, it's a very important book. Where I'm reading to you today is from the very beginning of the book. Chapter 4 is pretty close to the beginning. And what has happened is, uh, well, Acts is part of a two-part series. The Gospel of Luke is part one, and the book of Acts is part two. They have the same author. And the Gospel of Luke tells the story of Jesus Christ's uh, birth, life, death, and resurrection. And then the Gospel of Acts, the book of Acts continues that story after the resurrection of what the community, what the disciples did after that. So it begins after the resurrection. It begins with Pentecost, which is the story of the Holy Spirit joining the church. And then there's uh, some stories about Peter and John teaching and preaching throughout Jerusalem. And then we come to this part right here that describes the Acts community and how they live. So let's listen to this description of this very first church community, how they live as church, because we are living as a church. So how did they do it? Let's listen. During those days, the entire community of believers was deeply united in heart and soul to such an extent that they stopped claiming private ownership of their possessions. Instead, they held everything in common. The apostles, with great power, gave their eyewitness reports to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Everyone was surrounded by an extraordinary grace. Not a single person in the community was in need, because those who had sold what they had and brought the proceeds to the emissaries of the Lord. Then they distributed the funds to individuals according to their needs. This is our reading according to the book of Acts. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is They All Know We Are Christians. <laughs>
Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be truly acceptable in your sight, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. That's the Acts community. That's a picture of the Acts community. Um, I love the book of Acts. I love reading it. I find it inspiring. I find it offers great direction. I love hearing what happened to the community, how they moved, how they grew, um, how they shared this good news of God's grace. And uh, I think it gives us a really good glimpse into the church community. And it's, like I said, not a book that we read uh, congregationally very often. But when we read it, we find that what they saw, what they experienced, what they knew from their relationship with Jesus was transformative. They were changed, and changed deeply by this grace and this love that they experienced. They were completely transformed. They lived their lives in a radical and extreme and different way, and because they had experienced the resurrection of Jesus. They had experienced God's grace among them. They, they lived and they treated everyone like family. And I know we don't always love all of our family, so let's not go with particularly that definition, but picture the family that you love the most. Picture the people in your family that you would do anything anything for. Jump in front of a moving vehicle for. You love them really, truly, through and through. That's the type of family that they live in community life. They shared all that they had. Nobody said this was mine. Everything was shared in common. It was very surprising. It was very unusual. When people saw this community doing this, they were like, strange. Because everything else in the world at that time was transactional. Right? You give me this, I give you, I give you this, you give me that. Transactional. I love you, you love me. I give you uh, goods, you give me money in exchange for the goods. Not unlike today. Everything has purpose, like this payback. We live in a transactional society. We still do. Um, and even for transactions for which there is no immediate payback or return, we often have uh, in our culture uh, that we've adopted from other cultures this idea of karma. That, uh, you know, uh, I will, when I am good, I will receive good things because that is how the world works. And when they are bad, because I'm not bad, they're bad. When they are bad, they will get bad things because, you know, that's how transactional society works. But this resurrection of Jesus, this idea of God's spirit among us, this idea of grace among us, changed this community so life was no longer transactional. It was never again about what I give back for what I give. I'm giving because I can give. I'm giving because I have received. I'm giving because I have this. I want you to have the same thing. And I need nothing back from you in return. It's this radical idea of community that was made with this. And it's not just a nice idea. This was really how they were living. And this idea of people living this way, it continues. It wasn't just that time and place. People still throughout history have adopted this radical idea of giving of themselves so that others may have what they have without expecting anything in return. And, and for many of those people, it's because they've witnessed God's love in the world. And however they witness it, whether it's through the Christian avenue or the many different ways in which people encounter God's love, the many different religious ways or secular ways in which people encounter the greatness of creation and love in the world, and you ch it changes them and changes everything about them after that. It's like a light 
shining in the darkness. It's like a beacon. It's like this new life and new hope that happens. And when you see it happen to people, you see it happen to them. They live differently. And we in this community call it grace. And grace is uh, an interesting word that we use. It comes from a Hebrew uh, word that we've adopted and called it grace in English. Um, and it's it's a description of God's character. God is gracious. God is gracious. And what that means is it's, it's giving this gift with no strings attached. It's about showing kindness and compassion. God offers us kindness and compassion. God offers us creation with no strings attached. Not for asking anything. It's a gift when it's deserved, and it's a gift when it's not deserved. And there's stories in the Bible where they use this term grace, and they use it for times when grace is not always deserved. It's not transactional that way. There's a story about Jacob and Yesu, his brother. And Jacob steals Yesu's uh, birthright, and then he runs away for 20 years. And then he comes back to Yesu, and he asks Yesu for grace, for forgiveness. And Yesu offers it with nothing in return. His brother has wronged him. He doesn't deserve this love and compassion, but he gives it anyway. And when they write that word in Hebrew, we pronounce it as grace. And there's also so many examples throughout our history of people who've lived out this calling, who've lived out this calling to live in grace in the world. To live and offer love and compassion and life to others just because they have it. Because they know what it's like to have life. To have love. To have compassion. They give it to the world. We know stories like Mother Teresa. Other stories I read this week... I'll share with you, uh, I, don't, you probably, I know you've heard of Harry Tubman before, but if you've heard her story, it's remarkable. Um, she was born into slavery in, uh, I'll tell you where, Maryland, in Maryland. And uh, she was born into slavery, and, when, and she was born in 19, no, 1820. And in 18... 49, when she was 29 years old, she heard that she was likely going to be sold to another family. And not wanting to be sold and, and not wanting to live in this horrible, you, you know how horrible that life would have been. She opted to follow this underground railroad that she had heard about. She heard about how to do this. She had heard from, from people how to do this follow this path north, and she did it, and she made it, 80 miles. It's like if we walked from here to Halifax, but not only did we walk, we have to hide. You can only walk at night. You have to hide the whole time because there's people looking for you, and if they find you, the best thing that will happen is that you will be beaten. You'll probably be killed. She hid her way all the way from Maryland up to Philadelphia. No. Yeah. And that's 80 miles through darkness, through woods. She traveled that whole way following these clues, these hints that she had gathered from listening and gleaning over the years how to get there, what was the safest way. She found her way. And when she got to freedom, she could have just said, yay, I'm free. I can, I can sit here and not worry about being sold or beaten. I can live my life out. I can live out the rest of my days, but it's not what she did. She traveled back. She took the risk again of being found, being beaten, being killed. She traveled back the 80 kilometers back down to where she had been living and brought more people with her and showed them the way. She brought them with her back up through the Underground Railroad. She came down and got family and friends and neighbors and people she didn't even know and showed them the way to freedom. She didn't do it once, 
She did it 13 times. 13 times she said, it's more important to me that you have what I have. It's more important to me that you know what freedom is because I have now known it. I'm willing to risk all of that. I'm willing to risk everything I've got. I'm willing to risk my life so that you might have a taste of this too. It's an amazing, phenomenal story. I encourage you, there's a movie um, called Harriet, and it's awesome. You should watch it. Because she goes on to do even more amazing things. She fights in the Civil War. She uh, fights for civil for uh, voting rights for women. She's a phenomenal, phenomenal image of grace in history. Another image of grace in history that I read about uh, this week is Desmond Doss. And you might know his story through a movie called Hacksaw Ridge. He was a World War II uh, medic. Uh, when he joined, uh, when he was conscripted for the war, he was a conscientious objector. He, he was raised in a faith tradition that he was a pacifist, so he would not pick up a weapon. It caused him a lot of um, anguish because people were uh, constantly angry at him for not picking up a weapon. Like, how are you going to defend me if you won't even pick up a weapon? His, his fellow soldiers were, were not happy with him at all. But as a medic, he felt that he was there to help and that he could help them in any way he can. And they came to this battle um, at, ha at Hacksaw Ridge. And this is what the ridge looked like. And they were up on the ridge, and they were quickly overcome. And the unit uh, suffered massive casualties. And about half of them, I think, were able to come down the ridge to safety. And uh, Desmond was one of the ones that was down in safety. And when he was down on the ground, down at the bottom of the cliff in safety, he heard his fellow soldiers crying out in pain and in anguish. They were wounded but still alive up on the ridge, and they were surely all going to die. So rather than say, I'm, I'm safe, I'm okay, I'm, I'm, my life is preserved, he climbed back up the ridge, and he, through the night and through the next morning, continued to find soldiers, bring them to the ridge, and lower them down. It was exhausting, terrifying work. He was continually fired at. They continued to try to kill him, but he kept getting these wounded soldiers and lowering them down the ridge. And all night long, every time he would lower one down, he would say, please, let me just save one more. Because he knew how precious life was. He loved them the way he loved the family member that he would jump out in front of the car for, and yet many of these people were strangers to him. He loved them that deeply. He loved them with grace. So he kept going back. Desmond was interviewed afterwards, and he believed he saved 50 people. The army said, no, no, it was 100. So now today, when you read, it says 75. They decided to meet it in the middle. 75 times for sure that man went back into the line of fire, saved these people and lowered them down this ridge to safety because of love. Because he had this gift of life, of love, of compassion and grace, and he wanted to give it to others. That's the power. There's power in all of these stories. This is why I love reading about the Acts community because there is beautiful gifts in reading about that and these other stories because it, it lets us know it's possible that each one of us has the power and the possibility to change the entire world. We may be ordinary people doing ordinary things, but the results can be extraordinary when we add grace. And I know that living in community isn't easy. It's not. It takes sacrifice. It takes a willingness for us to let go of selfishness and possessiveness, which is human traits that are just in us. And we have to do the opposite. We have to let go. We have to care for each other like the family that we love. 
We have to live like people like Harriet and Desmond, who are the ideal, and they're what we strive for. And these stories, like the Axe community, are the ideal. They were, they're what we strive for. And even the early church wasn't able to sustain this community. As you continue to read through Acts, they weren't able to sustain that community that they first established. But they continued to try. They got up every day and tried again. They got up every day and tried to share what they had, to take care of each other, to show what it means to be a community of grace. And that's the kind of community we're called to be. That's the kind of community, when we hear these stories in Scripture, that we are called to be. And every time we hear the story of God's love for us, made known in the person of Jesus, I hope it transforms us. I hope we're transformed like that community. Every time we realize the extreme love that Christ had for us, that he never met us, but that he died for us. Our life was more important than his. That's the reality of the Easter promise. That's the gift that we receive every time we come together and hear these stories. And I pray that it changes us, like receiving a gift of berries on our step. Like every act of kindness that we receive in the world, I hope it changes us and inspires us to go and offer goodness and grace and change in the world. And then changing the whole world through our love. Because it's real and it's possible. This is the good news of God's grace in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you now with hearts full of gratitude and petitions for the world and for one another. As we lift our prayers, we hold our hearts to the needs of our community, our nation, and our world. O oh God, we pray for the church. We pray for unity and renewal. May your spirit continue to guide us as we seek to be faithful disciples, sharing your love and grace with all that we meet. Give us wisdom and courage to live out our calling as witnesses to your transformative power. Oh God, we pray for those who are suffering. We pray for comfort and healing. We pray that you are with those who are sick, who are grieving, or facing difficult times, that they feel your presence surround them. Grant them strength to face each new day. We pray for those who are marginalized, who are oppressed. We pray for justice and liberation. We pray, oh God, that you help us work tirelessly for a world where all are treated with dignity and respect. We pray for the planet, for our stewardship and sustainability. Help us to care for the earth and all its inhabitants, recognizing how we are all connected and how we are responsible for future generations. We pray for ourselves. We pray for guidance and strength. Help us to be instruments of your peace, agents of your love, and vessels of your grace to the world. Grant us the courage to step out in faith, trusting in your promise to never leave us or forsake us. God of compassion and care, we pray soundly for those we hold in our hearts this day. Source of all light, we praise you for the wisdom of your word and the hope of your promises. With all your saints on earth and in heaven, we commit ourselves to the dawn of your new age. And we pray together as we are taught by saying, Divine Creator, Holy Parent, our Mother and our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Thine is the Glory.
We have 